Okay, so before we move on to the digestive tract itself, um, let's look at this histology slide of the layers of the alimentary canal. <clears throat> so this last unit, digestive system, urinary system, um, the reproductive system, and endocrine system, you're going to have histology images um, come back. Uh, there's going to be a lot of histology that you're going to be responsible for. And one of the slides is this. So you're going to want to be able to recognize the histology slide of small intestine um, as well as large intestine. <clears throat> and there's ways that you can tell the difference. But we're looking at small intestine right here because the um, diagram here is basically what this is of. So let me walk you through what you're responsible for. So you're going to want to be able to identify all four layers of the digestive tract. So mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, and serosa, as well as the subparts. So first, let's just start with the big four, all right? So the first thing you want to look at is the mucosa. So the mucosa is predominantly epithelial cells, and epithelial cells are very close together, right? That's what we learned. The tissue is just very cell next to cell next to cell. When you have nuclei so close together, the nucleus is what really picks up the stain, and so you're going to have a very darker staining layer. So epithelial cells will always be very dark, and as you know, they're always on the surface. So you see how we have a lot of this dark purple? That's basically the nuclei of our epithelium, and we are going to have this dark coloration end about here, right, where my cursor is. And you can see that line, right, that the dark purple uh, ends at a very clear level. And so that's the end of our um, epithelium and lamina propria. So lamina propria, that connective tissue, is very thin. And uh, it's, it's actually too zoomed out, this, this picture, to really take a look at it. <clears throat> and then we're going to reach the submucosa, there's a big transition between mucosa, that's purple here, or darker, submucosa, which is going to be predominantly connective tissue, which is the cells are there, but they're far apart. There's going to be a lot of fibers. Those don't stain very darkly. So look at this big transition, right? We have dark, and then we have this pink. So this area where my cursor is here, this is the submucosa, okay? <clears throat> now, remember there is that line I told you about, that small muscle layer the muscularis mucosa here, right? And that's actually technically part of the mucosa, but that, that is smooth muscle. And if you take a look at here, this is also smooth muscle, right? This is a band, this is your muscularis externa. So at this point in the semester, you should know that smooth muscle looks like this. This is a typical smooth muscle tissue. And you can see this kind of thing happening here, right? The muscularis mucosa, you can see this line all the way up, right, sort of just hugging the bottom of our of our mucosa layer. And so that light pink is going to be that band of smooth muscle. So you want to recognize that muscularis mucosa, okay? Um, inside the submucosa, there's nothing to recognize. Just recognize the layer that is the submucosa. Then you want to recognize the muscularis externa. So the muscularis externa, you should be able to tell the two layers here, right? You can see the, the pattern of the cells and uh, are different than the pattern of the cells here, right? So you have this inner circular uh, muscle and then you have an outer longitudinal muscle. So remember, there's a saying, um, your inner circle of friends, right? So just that's the same thing here. The circular layer is inner. It's the inner circular outer longitudinal, okay? So, but you should be able to sort of see there's a very different kind of patterning that goes on between the um, circular layer and the longitudinal layer. And then the last layer is serosa. So remember serosa is just one simple squamous cell layer. So it's very thin and invisible, basically at this level that you're looking at here. So you would just simply point to the outside and say that's the serosa. Or if there's like an arrow coming to the outside, right, that's the serosa. Okay, so that's, that's the layers. And then the other thing is, how do you know this is small intestine? <clears throat> so remember, I mentioned that the, if you're walking in the, inside the small intestine, you'd have to go up a hill and down a hill and up a hill and down a hill. And those are called plica, and those are specific to small intestine. So let's find the plica in the histology slide. So um, looking at this, right, this entire 
up and down, that's applica, all right? So this entire up and down, that's applica. So look, look at the applica here. It's the entire, I like to call it a hill. So it's kind of like this entire hill um, of your small intestine. And um, so you can see the submucosa really makes a dramatic upward projection into that plica. Okay. Now, what are the other guys? Those are called villi. <clears throat> this is also very typical of a small intestine. So I didn't mention them here, but the villi are these finger like projections, right? So if you're walking up the hill, the big plica, you'd have, you know, these annoying sort of up and downs like these. You can think of them as like, I don't know, cacti or something. But those are the villi. They're finger-like projections of the um, mucosa to increase surface area um, to in contact with the food. Because remember, we're in the small intestine. The small intestine's main job is to absorb, absorb, absorb your nutrients. So you want as much surface area in contact with that liquefied food as possible. So the small intestine has set up these three features for that. So the first feature is this plica, right? Why have hills? Because it increases the surface area. Why have villi, those little yellow orange lines that come away like little fingers? Those are the villi, those increase surface area. And then there's a third um, structure which is mentioned later in the outline, but the third is microvilli. So on every single Cell, it's not even pictured here, it's too small, but every single cell that lines the villi will have microvilli. So all the epithelial cells here, they'll be columnar with microvilli, okay? So um, in this picture, let's just, what can you see? We can see the villi, okay? So you see this finger-like projection out. So what I think it looks like, I think it looks like a hillside on fire, right? So the plica is the hillside, and then the, the flames, if it were on fire, those are the villi. So stereotypical, like this very, um, very characteristic of a small intestine, you're looking for a plica, right? You're looking for this really upward projection, hill-like structure that is made very obvious by the submucosa. And you're also looking for villi, okay? Both of those things are not present in large intestine. All right, so that's your histology lesson there. Um, Let's look at the alimentary canal. So let's look at letter A. We're starting with the mouth. And um, in the mouth, we have our tongue. So our tongue is skeletal muscle, right? You can uh, voluntarily control the tongue for eating, for talking. Um, and the tongue is going to be have two attachment sites. The first one's called the lingual frenulum. And that's that little, um, I don't have a picture of it, but it's underneath your tongue. If you lifted up your tongue, you'd see that line. Um, that attaches it to the mucosa of the bottom of your mouth. That's the lingual frenulum. And then it's uh, inferiorly attached to the hyoid bone. On the tongue, you have papillae. There are four different kinds of papillae. So papillae means little bump. And so there's four kinds of bumps on your tongue. And this is what you can physically see in the mirror. If you stuck out your tongue, you saw those bumps. Those are papillae. They're not taste buds. Taste buds are microscopic. You can't see them. So I, I like this picture because it shows you the different kinds of uh, papillae. So let's go through your notes. The first one is going to be uh, filiform. So the filiform papillae is in this picture here. And this is different than the rest. Um, so this is a keratinized <clears throat> papilla. So this upper part here is going to be keratinized. And so because it's keratinized, it'll appear white on the tongue, um, it's there are no taste buds. So if you take a look at the other pictures where it says the word taste bud, you can see the nerve, right? The nerve is coming into a papilla and creating a taste bud. Here are nerves and there are our taste buds. Here's more nerves and there's taste buds. So the, this papilla, this bump on your tongue, does not have a role in taste. It actually has a role in mechanical breakdown. So in your notes, it's rough, right? Because it's keratinized. Uh, it's the most numerous papilla on your tongue. There are no taste buds, but it's kind of like having fine sandpaper. So like a cat's tongue is very rough. Um, our tongue is not as rough as a cat's tongue, but it does have this feature to sort of, you know, work a, a micro grind or like sandpaper on the food. So that's that filiform papilla. The other shapes, <clears throat> the foliate papilla is here. 
it looks just like a sort of a mushroom top right and you have grooves on either side so that when you are uh, mixing your food with saliva the nutrient or sort of like the organic molecules can fall into these crevices and they can contact the taste buds and the the chemicals in food can be you know detected then you have the um, fungiform papilla which is over here very similar fungiform actually means mushroom like and then valate the valate papillae are really large and just located in the back of the tongue okay so the valate papillae um, if you you can see this if you can open your mouth really wide and stick out your tongue really far um, you'll probably get a glimpse of a few of these valley papillae. They're really large. Um, these can also be found um, on the pharynx. Let's take a look at the other picture here. Um, so it's very similar, except it shows you uh, a taste bud. So notice that our taste bud has uh, a mix of cells. It has your gustatory epithelial cells, right? So you have the actual tasting cells. Um, and then you're going to have them um, connected to the nerve endings, of course. Um, and then you have other cells here, a basal cell, some um, support cells, but that is basically a taste bud, okay? You're going to have the gustatory cells will have hairs on the end, again, to increase surface area to contact the chemicals in the food, okay? And then this is what a taste bud looks like on the tongue. And so the tongue is going to be another one of your histology slides. Tongue is actually quite unique. So I don't think a lot of people mix tongue up with anything else. You can see, so when you see a picture like this, these are the things I want you to know. You want to recognize that it's tongue. Um, and then you also want to recognize what this feature is. So all you need to say is papilla, right? So if I ask you, what's this entire unit that's a papilla? If I bracket the structure, for example. And then you can see the taste buds, right? The taste buds are these light, staining areas because it's uh, you know we have some neurons there but those are taste buds okay and then the epithelium of the tongue right so what's this pink bright fuchsia upper layer of the tongue it's going to be um, stratified squamous okay so stratified squamous epithelium uh, we have the papilla and then we have our taste buds and that's it okay so let's look at an uh, actual tongue right so now you see a tongue up close, we can see that most of the tongue is coated in white um, bumps, right? So those are our filiform papillae. They don't taste, right? And then we can see interspersed, we have these bigger, rounder, more red looking taste buds that are actually, sorry, they're not taste buds, <laughs> papillae that have taste buds uh, embedded in their, in their walls. Okay, but it's kind of nice to see um, that if you do have a white coating on your tongue, right, it's, it's not abnormal. You should have white on your tongue because it's the filiform papillae. All right, so um, a couple other things before I move on to uh, the tooth. So remember you have lingual tonsils at the base of your tongue. Um, oh, let's talk about saliva. So while I, we talk about saliva, let's actually look at the slide for saliva. Here it is. So uh, your salivary glands, why don't we just talk about that now since the rest of this is all tied together. Your salivary glands, you're going to have six all together, right? So you have one, two at the base of each ear, right? And that's going to be your parotid. I don't know what happened to these leader lines, sorry. The parotid salivary gland is this guy. It's the largest salivary gland you have. It secretes amylase. So you should know what amylase breaks down. Amylase is an enzyme that breaks down starches, okay? Um, and then it also secretes a lot of water. And the reason why your saliva, this gland in, in particular, secretes a lot of water is to dilute the acids in your foods. So 25% of saliva is coming from this gland. So if you think about um, biting into a lemon or eating a very sour, uh, like a Sour Patch Kid candy, you, sometimes you get a squeezing or an uncomfortable feeling sort of in this area, right? At the base of your ear or in this cheek area. And that's because when you sense, and when the tongue senses acid, it there's a response to dilute the acid with water coming from the parotid gland. And there's smooth muscles in this gland to help push and squeeze out the saliva um, through a duct, right? So this is the parotid gland duct 
into the mouth. Why, is, uh, why did we evolve a need to dilute acids? Um, it's because acids will erode the enamel on your teeth. So your dentist does not like um, any acid, acidic foods, uh, doesn't like you to drink uh, any soda, right? Um, because the acid is going to erode the enamel. The enamel comes on when you're developing your teeth and that's the enamel you have for life. So once you lose the enamel, you don't grow any enamel back. Um, so that's why your dentists are so uh, vehemently, you know, um, pro enamel or anti acid. And that's the thing with cavities too. So um, dentists of course don't like sugar because when you eat sugar, the bacteria in your mouth ferment the sugar and as a byproduct makes acid. So when you eat sugar, the bacteria will kick out acid and that acid will destroy the enamel. So that's basically the reason why sugar is bad because the bacteria in your mouth will ferment it and make it acid. Um, anyways, so that is the uh, parotid gland. Then you have two more glands. Um, you're gonna have the sublingual gland under the tongue and then you're gonna have a submandibular gland. Um, it rests on the sort of right inside your mandible. So it's called submandibular. Okay, so if we look at the um, this number two where it says salivary glands, so you're gonna to want to know the position of the salivary glands and know where they are. And then under letter C, saliva, um, you wanna know what's in saliva. So basically amylase, which is uh, an enzyme that breaks down starch, lipases, which are enzymes that break down lipids, right? So fats. And then there's something called histatins. Histatins actually help wounds heal. So if you think about animals, um, when they are injured, they lick their wounds. Or if you get a paper cut, right, most of the time you'll put that finger with the paper cut in your mouth. So it's kind of this reaction that we have uh, with small cuts and with bleeding because it's been um, proven that histatins actually help wound healing. Um, and then a lot of water, of course, enzymes, ions, buffers, metabolites. Uh, you can check your saliva for different things, right? They can do uh, drug tests and look for antibodies in saliva. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting stuff in saliva, right? Um, okay, and then the uh, mucin is the mucousy kind of viscous or thick substance in saliva that makes it um, sort of lubricating your bolus. So when you're mixing the food with the saliva, right, the food becomes a little bit um, viscous and thick and, and uh, that's to help it be, becomes, you know, a bolus to be swallowed. So a bolus is a, a round, ball of food mixed with saliva. And so you would say that you swallow a bolus of food or you could say the esophagus receives a bolus of food, okay? Or just a bolus, that's, that's good enough too. All right, so moving on to the tooth. So I have to go back and take a look at teeth. So you're gonna want to know this picture, the anatomy of a tooth. Um, and the tooth has three major parts to it. It's the crown of the tooth is going to be anything above the gum line. All right. So the gum is called gingiva and the neck of the tooth is what is at the gum line. And then the root of the tooth is embedded in the bone. So remember the bone is either the mandible or the maxilla. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the crown. So you're going to have the enamel, right? So I, like I said, the enamel is laid down when you're forming the tooth and that's the enamel you have for life. Once you lose it, it does not grow back. Um, the enamel is not cellular. Um, it's not vascularized, of course, um, and it is basically this hypoxy appetite crystal. So it's the same hardened crystal that you have in bone, which is maybe why people lump together your bones and your teeth. Um, calcium is good for both of them because calcium helps to form that crystal. But other than that, your bones and your teeth look nothing the same. I mean, you just look at the way that they've sort of illustrated it in this diagram. Um, so enamel is the hardest substance in the body. That's true if you've heard that. Um, you know, unfortunately, when there's really big fires, um, you know, the person will, you know, all the organic matter will burn up. The bones might get burned up into ash, but the uh, enamel or the teeth might remain. And a lot of times I'll look for teeth remains as um, identifying uh, the victims. Um, all right, then under the enamel, so the enamel protects the underlying layers of the teeth. Um, and so underneath the enamel, we have something called dentin or dentine. 
Um, dentin is a, a yellowish substance and actually it's really yellow. I saw it once. Um, my dentist gave me a, a mirror and showed me when she was working on my tooth, I had a cavity, but it is really yellow. It's surprisingly yellow, like a banana peel. Um, so the enamel covers the dan dentin and um, the dentin is porous. So you can see how it's drawn here. It's, it's little tiny tubes. So little tiny tubes are found in the dentin that lead to the pulp. And so the dentin is, uh, it's a bone-like, it has mineral, it has collagen in it, it doesn't have any blood vessels. You can see the blood vessels don't go into the dentin. Um, but the reason why your tooth gains sensitivity if you have a cavity or if you have eroding enamel or if your gum starts to pull away. So anytime you have, ex if the enamel is compromised, um, so let's say uh, in just through normal aging, like people who are older are just going to have thinner enamel and uh, you wear the enamel away brushing your teeth. If you brush your teeth really hard and vigorously, um, you're going to wear that enamel down. So if the enamel starts to get really, really thin or expose some of this dentin, then the dentin is not a barrier at all. So anything that stimulates nerve endings can go right from the outside of your mouth and zip right through the dentin and go into the pulp. So the innermost part is called the pulp and the pulp contains your nerve endings. So sensitive teeth is basically due to the fact that the enamel has been eroded or maybe the gum right has pulled away to expose that dentin and that exposure of dentin allows those substances whether it's sugar whether it's extreme temperatures um, to irritate the nerve endings inside the pulp of the, the tooth so that's uh, sensitive teeth and if you buy toothpaste that is for sensitive teeth um, it basically contains a substance that helps to plug up those little tiny tubules of the dentin so just the physical blockage there which i thought was really interesting all right, so Roman numeral three, pulp cavity and the root canal. So the pulp cavity, which contains blood vessels and a nerve, does form a small canal as it works its way down to the root of the tooth. And that is literally called the root canal. So the root canal is both a physical feature of the tooth and a procedure that your dentist can do. People who need root canals have had a cavity that has gone deep, right? So let's say, we're, let's, Let's you know start out here, right? This is where bacteria live. The bacteria has um, formed a little hole in the enamel. It's gotten in here, and uh, once it gets to that dentin, once the enamel's gone, dentin is no barrier. That bacterial infection can just zip right into the pulp cavity. Then the bacteria can travel down into the root canal. At this point, you're probably in pain, um, and you're going to need to do a root canal. So the dentist has to. Um, open up the tooth, basically come down into the root canal and clean up all that infected tissue. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then put everything back together again. So the root canal is a big deal because that infection has gone into that um, part of the root that's very deep down. And there's a risk of blood infection, right? So once the bacteria has um, come into the pulp cavity, it, there's, um, you know, a focal infection could have happened. So the, the, the bacteria or the infection can travel into the bloodstream to another part of your body and cause an infection there. So it's kind of dangerous. Um, but that is the root canal. Okay. So let's look at the neck. And it's not much of the neck. Neck is just the gingiva line. Um, we looked at the root. Oh, okay. So we learned this um, back in the, the uh, articulations chapter. So this, this layer called cement is going to tie the root of the tooth to the periodontal ligament. So this crisscrossing uh, structure here, it's called the periodontal ligament. So remember this ligament is what actually holds the tooth into the bone. So again, if you have infection that comes down between the tooth and the bone, you can erode that ligament and you can lose the teeth. So just a reminder that we have our, the cement on the, on the tooth is directly connecting to the periodontal ligament. All right, so let's look at the teeth. So I'm not going to have you guys learn the different kinds of teeth that you have, but an appreciation for the different shapes of the tooth. So um, 
this part here is what you see on the outside. We can see that the teeth begin sharp in sort of like a, a knife blade. And then in the back of the mouth, we have flatter teeth, right, that are broader. So the anterior teeth we have are for ripping and tearing uh, the food. And the back of our mouth is for grinding the food. So we have teeth. The anatomy of the tooth um, shows different functions. All right, um, this next picture here is of a four-year-old skull. So it's a sad picture, um, but we do see really interesting teeth here, right? So we have our first or his first set of teeth here, and then we have our second set that are set to erupt, okay? So they don't actually start off, if you have a newborn baby, you don't have a fully formed molar here. Um, they, are, they start off small and they gradually develop so uh, we call our first set of teeth deciduous teeth because um, just like deciduous trees, they're gonna lose their leaves. So we lose our first set of teeth and then our second set is developing in the bone and then we'll eventually push those baby teeth out, right, the deciduous teeth. And then the permanent teeth are what we have now, the adult teeth. All right, so looking at number uh, four, the oral cavity structures, there's nothing really new here. Um, we went over the different parts of the pharynx, the epiglottis. Uh, labia is the only new word here. Uh, labia is the word for lips. Um, so, but everything else is pretty standard. So I'm going to leave this picture. We don't need to talk about it. And then let's talk about swallowing. So when we swallow uh, the food, remember there is this common passage, our pharynx, which uh, connects to our nose. And then down here we have a two different pathways. Uh, we have an anterior pathway. This is our trachea. The posterior pathway is going to be our esophagus. So I mentioned this before um, the lecture too, um, but let's look at right here because this is this should be familiar, right? So when you swallow, the epiglottis is going to move down. It's going to cover the opening to our trachea or cover the glottis, right? So that's going to be listed as number one. The larynx moves up. So the reflex action here is that the Adam's apple, you can see this on people when they swallow, and the Adam's apple will go up and down. And this is because muscles will, you know, pull on the larynx and pull on the hyoid bone to move the entire larynx up. This upward motion is going to push the um, epiglottis down, and so it closes off the glottis. So the food has no choice but to go down the posterior passage, uh, the esophagus. Now let's look at what's going on up here. As this person is swallowing, there is a movement of the tongue that comes up, right? And then this feature here, this is our soft palate. The soft palate is going to get pushed by the tongue and completely block the passageway into the nasal cavity. So we're trapping the food to go down the esophagus and we're not allowing the food uh, to come up into the nasal cavity, right? Because our soft palate is closing off our nasal cavity. Now, this reflex action, we've all maybe in our lives have um, either coughed or sneezed or maybe laughed um, when we're trying to swallow and then the, the food will move you know up into the nasal cavity or you can like disrupt you know the the reflex action and you might be able to you might inhale some food which is terrible but either way this reflex action it can be interrupted when you're like when something um, like laughing or sneezing happens while you're trying to swallow all right, so moving into the um, esophagus. So the esophagus is another histology slide that you want to be able to look at and recognize. So it is a collapsed lumen. The esophagus has, um, it's basically collapsed most times, right? It only opens up when you're swallowing. So the lumen will always look uniquely collapsed. The lining of the esophagus is gonna be stratified squamous because this is responsible for um, receiving the bolus, and the bolus is gonna scrape the edges of the esophagus as it goes down. And then after that, after you mu mucosa layers, notice how it's dark mucosa. Submucosa becomes light gray in this instance, it's very light. So it goes from dark to light, mucosa, submucosa. Muscularis externa should be pretty obvious. Smooth muscle is always gonna be this pink color. And then you're going to see the fourth layer called adventitia. So this is unique just to the esophagus because the esophagus is not, right, look at it. It's not inside our abdominal pelvic cavity. It's actually within the thoracic cavity. So since it's not inside here, 
it's not going to be covered with serosa. It's going to be covered with something called adventitia, which is a tougher kind of connective tissue. Okay, so that's the only trick here is that the, the last layer of the um, esophagus is adventitia. All right, so let's look at the um, entrance into the stomach. Um, <clears throat> when the, oh, actually maybe we'll stay on here. So let's look at the position here. So the um, number uh, three under esophagus, you have an upper esophageal sphincter and a lower esophageal sphincter. These are not well-defined muscles, but up here by the pharynx, actually, let me move to the first picture. So I, I'm showing you this larger picture because it's easier to see. So in this region, ex right when you swallow the food, there's going to be this um, lower pharyngeal constrictor muscle, which is going to help squeeze and propel the food into the esophagus. Um, and that really acts as like our upper esophageal sphincter. So it's going to help to push that bolus into the esophagus. The lower esophageal sphincter, there's another circular muscle here or a thickened portion of the wall of the esophagus, what we call the lower esophageal sphincter, otherwise known as the cardiac sphincter. And the reason why it's called cardiac sphincter is because this air, this very first little area, just three centimeters away from the esophagus, this region is called the cardiac region of the stomach. So the sphincter is called the cardiac sphincter. And this is the lower esophageal sphincter. So once the bolus of food enters the stomach, this sphincter closes, right? And only opens to allow another bolus of food to come into the stomach. But this should be closed because as the stomach begins to digest the food, the stomach will produce a lot of um, acids and the acids will, um, if it does come up through that sphincter, will burn the sides of your esophagus because the esophagus is not um, lined with very thick mucus like the stomach is and the esophagus will, uh, the lining will get hurt by the acids, whereas the stomach protects itself with um, acid. So this is heartburn, you guys. So when you do have acid, right, acid reflux, acid from the stomach come up through the esophageal sphincter here. So <clears throat> again, the sphincter can be relaxed if you're having heartburn and the acid splash the wall of your esophagus. That hurts and that's heartburn. And notice why they call it heartburn because notice where it is, right? We're in this general area. This is also the area where we have our heart. So um, it's not the heart that's in pain. It's actually this junction between the stomach and the esophagus and the esophagus is getting acid um, splashed onto it. So it hurts. So that's a heartburn or acid reflux. All right. So let's, um, I'm going to pause it here and we'll talk about the stomach and then part three.